OK, so this example, I think, was a bit different to some of the other ones. Um, we've got a same kind of setup as before. So we've got these two different particles that are hanging. Most of this information up here is pretty just whatever's in the diagram, really, isn't it? Like everything here, it says it starts from rest, and this is what it looks like. So I'm not going to worry too much about what it says there. Um, I think part A, part B, and part C is the kind of straightforward sort of stuff that we already know how to do. So we'll go through that really quick, and then we'll try and get on to part D quite quickly, OK? So I'm going to first of all start off with thinking about the forces that we've got on this diagram. We should have got quite used to what these forces look like. It says that P is 0.5 G, and Q, therefore, is the other one, which is 0.4 G. We've got the tension going up here and the tension going up here. We know that this one is going to accelerate downwards and this one is going to accelerate upwards. So first of all, we wanted to write down the equation of motion for P. So this is for P, which we know is going to resolve downwards. And we're going to use F equals MA. So it should be 0.5 G minus T equals the mass times the acceleration. Then for the second part, we're looking at particle Q. We will resolve upwards this time because it's moving upwards. And we'll use F equals MA. So the equation of motion for this one is a bit different. You should have this one first, take away this one. So you get T minus 0.4G equals 0.4A. The more that you do of these questions, the more you'll notice that these always look like this kind of thing, that you're always going to have a weight minus a tension and then a tension minus a weight. And so that's the first part done and the first part done there. So we've got those four marks immediately. Now it wants us to find the tension in the string and then the acceleration of the particles. So what do you think part B and C is asking for us to do? Simultaneous equations. So I've got equation one here and equation two here. So for part B, it doesn't matter if we do these in a different order to each other. Okay, We could find out the acceleration first and then find out the tension. So I'm actually going to do part B and I'm going to do part C at the same time. That's absolutely fine to do. So I'm going to add together equation 1 and 2. We figured that's often the best way of doing this. So I'll have 0.5g minus t plus t minus 0.4g. So the, the t's are going to cancel, and we just get 0.5g minus 0.4g equals these two bits added together, which is 0.9a. So that becomes 0.1 g divided by 0.9 is equal to a. So a is a ninth g. And if we wanted that as a decimal, I think it's probably not going to be a particularly nice decimal. Uh, yeah, we probably won't want to have it as a decimal. We'll keep it as a fraction as 49 over 45. So we either keep it in terms of g or not. Which equation do we say is better to use to find out the tension for part c or for part b? The second one. I think the second one looks easier. So now we're going to rearrange 2. So we get t equals 0.4a plus 0.4g. So that's 0.4 multiplied by this, which is 49 over 45, plus 0.4 times 9.8. So we're going to multiply that by 0.4 and add on 0.4 times 9.8. And we get that the tension is 4.3555 recurring, or just 4.36 newtons to three significant figures. OK, I guess I should have really said that the 49 over 45 is 1.09 meters per second to three significant figures. That bit, I'm sure, was easy. I'm sure you're all able to do that bit. We've done B and we've done C. This is where things now start changing. It says, when the particles have been moving for 0.2 seconds, the string breaks. The string breaks. So if the string breaks, is there going to be, what's going to change about this situation? The tension. The tension is no longer there because the string has snapped. So it's not tight anymore, which means there's no tension. So after 0.2 seconds, the string is going to break, which means the tension will then become zero. We want to then find the further time that elapses until Q hits the floor. So we better think about what happens here. Q is moving upwards for 0.2 seconds. Then the string breaks. And when the string breaks, there's no tension, which means there's going to be a new acceleration. The acceleration for this particle, we can very quickly tell what the acceleration will be by looking at this. And we'll do that in just a second. And then we need to find out how long it takes for it to hit the floor. 
So there's a few bits of information that we're going to need to do for part D of the question. First of all, we're going to have to work out um, in, why does it do this? It's so annoying. So we're going to talk about the first 0 0.2 seconds of motion. And we know that the acceleration is 49 over 45, because we worked that out over here. We know it starts from rest, and we know that it's traveling for 0 0.2 seconds. And I'm going to start off by finding out what speed it is going at at that point. That might be something that we need to use for the second part of the SUVAT, because do you remember we said that the V becomes the U? So I'm going to work out V by doing U plus AT, which is just 0 plus 0 0.2 times 49 over 45, which is 49 over 225. I'm just going to keep that as a, um, as a fraction, because I know I'm going to probably have to use that later on. There's probably something else that might be useful to find out here as well, and that's going to be how far it's traveled. So we're actually talking about here, in the first 0 0.2 seconds, Q is going to have traveled up to a particular point here. And it might be useful to know this distance, because later on, we want to find out how long it takes for Q to hit the floor. So we need to then know what's going to happen at this point that it's got here. That might be something that we need to know, OK? So I'm going to come back down here, and I'm also going to work out what S is equal to. So I've got S, U, A, and T. I know that S is equal to U, T plus a half A, T squared. So S is equal to, well, that's 0. And we've got a half times A times T squared. So let's just quickly work that out. We've got a half times A times t squared. So that's 49 over 0 point, oh sorry, what am I talking about? 0 point, I'm looking at the wrong thing altogether. 49 over 2250. And I'm keeping them as fractions just because they're recurring decimals. So now we're going to have to do, after this first 0 0.2, 0 0.2 seconds of motion, we know that the string breaks. So there will be a new acceleration for particle Q. And the reason that there will be a new acceleration for particle Q is because if we have this thing here, and I just examine what happens, because the string breaks and the tension becomes 0, the equation of motion changes, and you get minus 0.4g equals 0.4a. If you divide both sides by 0.4, you get that the acceleration is minus g, or the acceleration is minus 9.8. So we're now going to do a final bit of SUVAT. So we're going to now say after the string breaks. And we're going to try and do a last bit of SUVAT to think about what's happening here. Well, we know that the acceleration is minus 9.8. We also know what speed it is traveling at when the, speed, when the string breaks. What's the speed it's traveling at? Um, just this, not, not the root of this, just this one, just 49 over 225. Because the old final speed becomes the new initial speed. And we're trying to find out, find the further time that elapses until Q hits the floor. OK, looks like we're taking this direction as positive, right? So let's go back to the diagram for a second. We're now trying to say, how long does it take for particle Q from here? How long is it going to take for it to hit the floor down here? And we have taken upwards as our positive direction. So what do you think is my last type of thing I need to say about for this? Can I say what? S is, or what V is, or what T is, what can I write down for this bit here? S is 2 plus uh, Good. The thing we know about is how far it's going to be moving. Now, how far it's going to be moving 
is this bit here is two meters. What's this bit here? Yeah, we worked that out. It was 49 over 2,250. Is that right? So this total distance here is 2 plus that, which is 4549 over 2250. That's the total distance that Q is now going to be moving before it hits the floor. It's annoying that they're these horrible fractions. It'd be much nicer if they were just actual numbers. But that's basically 2.02, .02, OK? One thing we've got to be careful of is in our question, we've taken upwards as positive because we've got that the acceleration is negative. So what can you tell me about S, the displacement? It's going to be negative because it's falling downwards. And we've said that upwards was positive. So that just means for the thing that we've got here that S is minus 4549 over 2250. Now, we can't actually find out what V is. Sometimes the mistake that people might make is they say, oh, when it hits the floor, V is equal to 0. But that's after it has hit the floor. So that's not actually what V is. So we want to find out what T is equal to. So we get S equals U T plus a half A T squared. And putting this all on one side, we get 4.9t squared minus 49 over 225t minus 4549 over 2250 is equal to 0. And then you should use on your calculators the polynomial solver to solve this quadratic equation. So you have 4.9 for the first coefficient minus 49 over 225 and minus 4549 over 2250. And this then gives you that t is either equal to 0 0.665 or minus 0 0.621. Obviously, we can't have a negative time, so it is 0 0.665 seconds to three significant figures. So you can see why this is very, very, very demanding. It has brought together SUVAT, forces, F equals MA, problem solving, diagrams. It's basically all of mechanics, apart from variable acceleration, all in one topic. OK? Did anyone do this in a slightly different way who did this? I left it so much easier. You left it, did that make it a lot easier? Yeah. Yeah. OK, good. I, that's probably a, a good point, actually. If these were all left in terms of g, the whole question probably is a lot nicer. Um, I wish you'd said that at the beginning, because it got pretty messy, those numbers and stuff. Um, yeah, usually leaving things in terms of g is good. <coughs> I've said that before, and then I've gone against my own advice there. OK, no, did anyone do a different strategy for how you solve the problem at the end? Did you do any different way of doing that? No? 